some program notes. So for those of you who I don't know, I think I know just about all of you. For me, this is like a wedding. This is like six years of work product. I'm like, you should meet all these people because they're cool and they're from this side of my life and that side. And one of the things I'm so proud of, uh, by the way, Jennifer Gray Thompson, CEO of After the Fire. Thank you for being here. Hey. Um, I really want to say thank you to Audrey Vulcan for being coordinator this year. It was huh, much easier, um, and I am very grateful, and thank you. And last year was the first year, so always harder. But then this year, well, hopefully, we have worked out even more kinks, and I just appreciate all of your hard work. So thank you and your team. Um, okay, so here we go. This is the start of two and a half days of what I think is a very unique summit. Um, one of the things that we do is that we like to put uh, frontline communities in the room, people who are leaders in the actual long slog wildfire recovery, in the same room as people who work to, you know, prevent wildfire, people who attend to wildfire. We have our local uh, fire chief is here too, Steve Aker. I went to high school with him. That's cute, isn't it? Um, that I like that we are able to provide you with a 360 view of Megafire because, yeah, oh, Jim, Jim Alvey wants you to know he's here too. Good 360. Hey. Yes. Oh, oh, I got it. The joke. Okay. Now, see, and the reason why this group is small is because it's really important to me that you know each other. Um, for many of you, or several people in this room, you've seen me at lots of national conferences, David and Heather and Krista and Jim, and I'm always the only wildfire person there. I feel like people are like, there's that fire lady. Okay, we've handled wildfire, check, 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 but that's just not how this is, and we do have really cool, smart people working in this space, and to have you all in the same room means so much to me. You are in this room because I have either invited you or approved you to be here because I know that you are working really hard either to serve your community or to prevent it or in the private sector to innovate or to somehow solve the insurance issue. Insurance, IBHS is in the middle of the room for all of you to approach. Um, I just really wanna thank you. It is a commitment to be here of time. Uh, it's not the easiest place all the time to get to. I felt that way when I went to um, Bentonville, Arkansas two years ago, met Jim there, and it took me 14 hours of travel time. So I, I do have an idea of the commitment of being here. So. The way we've sectioned out the three days is um, first we're going to do the pillars of resilience, um, strengthening soft infrastructure and climate disasters. I did not narrow this to just megafires because a lot of you here work in wind and rain as well. But really, I think sometimes we don't, um, we know like instinctually when a disaster happens, like watching Maui, we're like, oh, it's so good that they have all those hubs. But those of us who've worked in the slog of recovery, we know that that takes people to get up every single day and to be creative and to serve the community in front of them. And that's really hard work. And how can we share best practices and hopefully make that somewhat easier? It's something we've been doing since the very beginning. That's me. Okay. Um, I did want to acknowledge our board members. Um, none of them are here right now, but they will be over the next few days. Um, Judy Coffey will be here. She's been our board president since 2019. Um, Lisa McKaylee, she will also be up here. And Marco Bay from Loma Cotzi, he will be up here. We have, I think, two members of our advisory board here. We have uh, Wendy um, Nystrom and Adrian Hines. So uh, it's really important to us that nobody pay to be here. We know that you're paying for hotel rooms and all that kind of stuff, but I don't want to charge admission to this. I am not knocking um, conferences that do charge admission, but if we did that, it would make it impossible for a lot of our smaller nonprofits and a lot of our fire communities to actually participate, which would go against everything that we stand for. So that would not happen. We begin with fire communities and we reverse engineer from there. Everything we do begins with the people actually on the front lines experiencing the disasters, especially survivors. So thank you to our sponsors who made this possible. Um, uh, Fannie Mae, who will be here. Um, um, IBHS, thank you. Sonoma Clean Power, Hannah. Alaska Airlines, if you, you know, flying is hard. They give us uh, a significant amount of uh, free flights a year, and some of you even got here uh, courtesy of Alaska Airlines, so thank you and feel good every time you fly them. CTEH, Galway Holdings, WUI, Flame Mapper, Perimeter, Kaiser, Footprint Project, 
Footprint Project is outside doing their solar build, uh, Tetra Tech, Watch Duty, Halter Project. If you have not downloaded Watch Duty and you are here, right here now in the height of fire season, then absolutely do download it. It's really a wonderful innovation. It's made my life much easier. I don't have to like track everything down on Twitter and then figure out who's you know good or not. So I um, highly recommend, and John will be here. They're also a nonprofit. So thank you very much for all of the sponsors in the room. All right, so for some of you who are here to learn about Megafire. I'm not necessarily going to read every word that's up here, but Megafire is a relatively new phenomenon as far as the constancy of it and the destruction of it. And we have moments where people really do see it and they understand and they lean into it. And that's how I get on like national radio shows or whatever because they notice it and then, then they focus away. So unfortunately what Maui did was that it sort of like raised it again, like why it is that we need to not only respond more appropriately nationally, but also prepare for, mitigate ahead of time, all of those items. So Megafire, uh, since 2017, that's when we were born. If you look up in our hills over here, you're gonna see that some of them are still charred from 2017. Um, this is not like, you know, baby owl in the woods, wildfire, loves it. These are Megafires, they're too hot. They're too fast, they're too destructive. And I know like many of you, watching what happened in Maui just made me ill for weeks because I couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, we need to solve it as far as a constant phenomenon is concerned and we can. Um, so since uh, 2017, we have worked in uh, California, Oregon, Colorado, we'll be in Maui in November. Uh, we wanted to wait till everybody left pretty much. Um, between 2017 and 2023, over 48 million acres in the United States alone have burned. That's about, that's about uh, 10 million less than burned in Canada this year, by the way, but those are mostly uninhabited areas. Um, there, are currently there are currently approximately, that's bad language, uh, 45 million U.S. homes located near or adjacent forest, shrubland, and grassland, according to the EPA. Uh, the National Interagency Fire Center estimates there are 71.8 million properties in the United States that are at some level of risk from wildfire. The only thing I'm gonna say about that is Megafire does not care about your wooey. Megafire goes where it wants to go. It, it will take, in our case, it took an overpass to take out Coffee Park. I always picture it looking both ways and then taking the overpass. So something to realize is that a wooey matters but it doesn't actually care that much about your wooey. Um, since 2017, in uh, wildfires, the United States have destroyed over 70,000 structures, the majority of which were homes. This is before Lahaina. Okay. Um, what I would like you to do is these are the wildfires where that are people are represented. So if you are from a wildfire community, I just hope that you could just stand up. Yeah. So what I'm so proud of is this is about 50% of you. And that I'm very proud of because that means I'm doing something right. That means that we're starting at the right place and that's how we need to work is backwards from what you need and reverse engineer into making our entire system of how we attend to mega fires, attend to what you actually need. Thank you, you can sit down. Um, these are all of the organizations that are here. I have this online. I just wanted to note that we have about 141 organizations. And um, this is, you know, we're not a, we, I'm not trying to make us into a big conference. I'm just trying to make us into the right people at the right room, in the right room at the right time. Thank you all for being here. You're all looking for your names. It's, okay. So, um, one thing I just wanted to note to sort of ground us is that, you know, working in disaster for almost six years straight, and people are like, your job must be so sad. I'm like, yeah, sometimes it's really sad. But my job, I, I meet the most kick-ass people on the planet in this room, all of you. You should know that. Um, and I love that because disasters reveal core humanity and connection, correct land management when it's working, um, innovation of materials, systems, paradigms, practices, and that's all represented in this room. 
It also, disasters reveal gross inequities, especially for rural and frontier communities. It just has to be said. It's not an equal playing field at all. It's something that we all have to pay attention to. Here in Sonoma County, we're about 97% rebuilt. We're not smarter than other communities. We are wealthy. That's it. Our land values are very high. And our incomes, comparatively, are also high. We have a high level of insurance, but underinsured. So while we're very, we have worked really hard on our recovery, we're not smarter than other communities like Paradise that's behind that five years at 98 you know, percent. Everyone is working very hard, but how can we actually share enough strategies so that we can, we can help so all, all boats rise? That's the point. Um, disasters reveal our frailties in our system. Disasters reveal magical thinking. And you know, most people in here don't engage in magical thinking, but all of us know tons of communities who do. And I worry for them a lot. Um, incorrect wildland management and outdated housing stock. Climate resilient housing is what we need to focus on over the next 20, 30, 40 years that we can live alongside of climate disasters. You know, building codes, they save lives, they do but building codes are a privilege and they're expensive. All right, so here is day one, pillars of resilience, strengthening soft infrastructure and climate disasters. I like this picture because we're in Sagamore in Marshall Fire um, in winter and we're listening to this guy's fire story and his house had just burned down about 435 homes, 4,000 square foot lots, small with basements. Um, totally out of the wooey, grassland fire, December 30th. In 12 hours, over 1,100 homes, and that's just damaged. I mean, that's just destroyed, not even damaged. So, um, inside the word emergency is emerge. From an emergency, new things come forth. The old certainties are crumbling fast, but danger and possibility are sisters. So every day I'm gonna start you with a quote like this. This is from a book that I love called Hope in the Dark. Uh, Rebecca Solnit is a beautiful essayist and she actually um, wrote a book called A Paradise Built in Hell. And it's about disasters. And she goes all the way back and finds that when we do have disasters, we don't all pull out our guns and start shooting each other and like hoarding our Cheerios. Like none of that happens. Instead we're like, I'll have a Cheerio and you'll have a Cheerio pass these three Cheerios on. We're actually wonderful at our heart. Most of humanity is great. So I wanted to start us there. So um, side note, if you are presenting today, we do have a timer over here. So please do keep an eye on that. Um, I would like to invite Brian Fees up. If you were here last year, then one of the things that you noticed was that um, we started with um, Dr. J. Wallace Nichols, who lost his home in the CZU Lightning Complex fire. And he grounded us, and he'd written a book called Dear Wild Child. Um, and a beautiful book. And so I wanted to carry on the same tradition. I met Brian right after the fires. I actually worked with his wife before the fires. She's in this, you'll see, she's amazing. Um, and so I asked Brian to come this time to sort of ground us again and why we're here and what does having a fire story mean because so many of us have a fire story here. Um, so he's actually a graphic novelist who's going to take you through that. He did win, um, there was a local Emmy was won for um, turning his graphic novel into an actual moving graphic novel. The F word is in it. If you are a delicate, this is the wrong conference for you. All right, please welcome Brian Fees.